Foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, good morning. This is Arlene, and you're listening to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. At our ASEAN Daily, we bring you news from Southeast Asia, and we start off with uh, the follow-up news from Lee Kuan Yew's state funeral. How his state funeral is being marked around the world. So we all know Lee Kuan Yew is a giant figure in Singapore's history and Singapore's politics, but um, apparently they will be uh, there will never be another Lee Kuan Yew, and Lee Kuan Yew, of course, is being attributed for building Singapore from a small town or a small island into a, a mega city island. And he is definitely revered all over the world as a strong statesman. Uh, from India, New Zealand and Russian embassy in Singapore has said that the national flag will be flown at half mass to mark the state funeral of Singapore's founding prime minister. Lee is revered by Singaporeans for his economic and social legacy, but criticized by rights groups for slight lining. Um, sidelining side political opponents clamping down on the press and civil liberties. Singapore has one of the highest GDP per capita incomes in the world at 56,284,000 ringgit sorry, thousand sing dollar in 2014, up from mere 516 sing dollar when it gained independence. And it is not just one of the highest percentage uh, of GB, GDP per capita income, but also one of the most expensive city in the world. Uh, though at the same time, the country also enjoy one of the lowest crime rates in the world. 19, 90% of Singaporeans own their homes thanks to a public housing, housing scheme launched by Lee Kuan Yew himself. So there's just a lot of uh, different uh, historical development that uh, we associated with Singapore. Uh, at the same time, we all know Singapore had a really robust and uh, really good team uh, when he started out in PAP. Uh, a lot of his associates uh, in PAP had been working side by side with him building Singapore as we know today. Uh, back in countries all over the world, we saw Bill Clinton also coming, uh, you know, um, dropping by Singapore just to pay his respect, his last respect towards uh, Lee Kuan Yew, um, the late Lee Kuan Yew, and also more than 500 people turned out to watch the live telecast of the state funeral of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew in Hong Kong. Um, in fact, people started streaming in the venue before noon time ahead of the telecast with many dressed in black to mourn the death of the Singapore's founding prime minister. You can in fact see in Instagram uh, photos of people just uh, paying his, their respect at the Singapore Consulate General, uh, sorry, Singapore, Singapore Consulate to Hong Kong. And in South Korea as well, the same thing is happening. You can see uh, photos of Instagram people, you know, li Singaporeans living in South Korea gathered in Seoul to watch the state funeral. And you can see you can see similar events happening in all over Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific, like in China, even in Malaysia. Uh, you can uh, the Singapore High Commission also telecast the live state funeral of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. 
And surprisingly, even Bhutan lowered its national flag to half mass as a mark of respect for the state funeral of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And other places in Southeast Asia, you can see Myanmar, the Philippines, uh, even in Japan, Thailand, uh, people were gathering in droves just to watch uh, the state funeral and pay their respect to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, besides that, uh, Lee Kuan Yew's uh, Singapore also honor uh, the state. The state, um, sorry. Besides that, Singapore also honor uh, Lee with an elaborate state funeral, and a lot of people uh, from Singapore were there. And in fact, uh, they there was some congestion that happened. Um, uh, where people really wanted to see um, Lee, uh, the last body of Lee Kuan Yew before being laid to rest. At another topic besides Lee is uh, the dengue fever that is happening in Malaysia. Of course, we all know uh, dengue is a serious, um, although understated, or although a bit understated. Um, uh, illness in Malaysia. In fact, uh, there are more than 3,000 uh, cases that have been emerged since uh, and actually every year, almost every year. Uh, be- because of that, uh, apparently there's, an deng- there's a dengue app uh, that lands Malaysia for a NAS- NASA scholarship. Malaysia Integrated Medical Professional Association President Dr. Desi Baharaja has won the Singularity University's Global Impact Competition 2015 for his research in dengue prevention. For until now, there's no cure for dengue. But for his innovative idea, Dr. Desi received a two-month scholarship to pursue his graduate studies at the National Aeronautic, Aeronautics and Space Administrations or NASA. Sorry, or NASA Research Park in Silicon Valley, United States. This is sponsored by Google and financial group ECM Libra. When you key in data, the app, the app will t- tell you if you are in high risk area. It can predict dengue hotspots one month in advance. The app makes use of different variables such as wind, direction, velocity, rainfall, thunderstorms, solar radiation, construction sites and altitude. So, um, congratulations to our Mr. Sorry, our Dr. Desi for such discovery, and hopefully, it will help to reduce the risk of Malaysians getting into dengue. On another news that we would like to mention is about China. As we all know, China is eyeing more maritime cooperation with ASEAN, even though that's uh, uh, there is a huge spat of the sea, of the sub-China Sea. Um, but at the same time, China do want to work with ASEAN. China hopes all-around maritime cooperation with ASEAN will become a model for building the 21st century maritime Silk Road, China State Councillor Yang Ziqi said. Why China is the right country to promote ASEAN economic and political cooperation? Well, China is our neighbor, that's for sure. But also, China is really keen on this region. Uh, this region has uh, definitely been a focus uh, for for China since probably a couple of years ago when China emerged to be one of the strongest economies in the world. In fact, Yang said China is willing to work with all countries involved to establish a win-win maritime partnership and strive for early progress. During his meeting with Tanasi Patim Progond, Thailand, Thailand Deputy Prime Minister Yang called for enhancing cooperation in railway and agriculture between China and Thailand. Tanasi Patim Pragond said his country backs the Belt and Road Initiative that will actively engage in its constructions and beef up economy and trade cooperation with China. While at the same time, China banks 
uh, want to share wealth to shape the new ASEAN new uh, sorry the new ASEAN order <laughs> it's a new term it seems it seems like. So at the forum, it's called the Boao Forum, which was conceived as an ASEAN, sorry, as an Asian version of the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, has typically focused on business and economic matters. But President Xi Jinping sketched out China's vision for a new security and economic order in Asia, offering to spread the benefits of Chinese prosperity and cooperation across the region. In fact, Mr. Xi stressed that China's version, while centered on Asia, was open to participation by all countries. He was careful not to place China at the center of emerging order, as some regional politicians and security experts have warned could happen. The speech was the latest by Mr. Xi to articulate his government's plans to use China's growing power to reshape economic and security arrangement in this region. At the centre of these efforts is the new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or the AIIB. Of course, uh, when we talk about AIIB, uh, it's growing uh, much in terms of its popularity or in and also its influence, even towards the Europeans. Uh, recently, we have seen countries like the UK have joined in uh, the AIIB, and of course, uh, other East Asia countries also would join suit. Other plans include plans to build infrastructure across Asia and along the maritime routes of the historical connections of the Chinese to the Middle East. Uh, we are talking about the Silk Road, as well as connectivity towards Africa and Europe. However, to realize its visions, China need the assistance. China needs the assistance of private companies and other lending institutions, such as the World Bank and ASEAN Development Bank. So, in a way, it's not truly. Um, an independent initiative. It does need some form of leverage with the World Bank and ASEAN Development Bank. But in terms of uh, the way, in terms of the way uh, AIIB is being seen by the Americans, that would be totally different. It's definitely a geopolitical threat towards the U.S. And I think the U.S. are looking at this seriously on how to address the bipolar world that is happening right now in terms of political in influence of between the Chinese and uh, of course the US we'll take one short break when we return we will talk about uh, some of the key security news in Southeast Asia <laughs> ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene and you're back again with more news from Southeast Asia. Of course, uh, when I say more news, meaning uh, all over Southeast Asia, we will highlight news that matters to you. So going back to uh, news about security issues, I'm talking about uh, what is happening in the Philippines earlier. If, you'll, uh, if you all know, a uh, couple of weeks earlier, as uh, the Philippines was terrorized by the radical group, and in fact, um, Aquino uh, is somehow has mar me uh, sorry, uh, marred Aquino's administration for not able to handle uh, the terrorist group in Mindanao in a way that uh, the in a way that would uh, be much more. Are smoother and in fact it causes it caused the death of 44 elite commando of the Philippines. So uh, the headline was that Aquino said terrorizing people in the name of peace. Uh, this is claimed by the UNA, um, the United Nation Nationalist Alliance accused uh, President Benigno Aquino the third of terrorizing the people in the name of peace by pushing for the Bangsa Moro basic law. Uh, this is another development about uh, how the Mindanao issue is taken has taken place. Uh, 
in a statement uh, last week, United Nationalist Alliance interim president said that Aquino's speech to mark the first year since the government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front signed a comprehensive agreement on the Bangsa Moro. Fear uh, is a uh, meant to solve fear instead of reason and rational discourse on the proposed Bangsa Moro basic law. In his speech, Aquino argued against all-out war of the Mindanao and pushed for passage of the BBL or the Bangsa Moro basic law, which will implement uh, the peace agreement within with the MILF. Uh, or the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. This will be achieved by creating a Bangsa Moro political entity that will have more autonomy but will remain part of the Philippines. Aquino, to those who have called for Aquino, say to those that who have called for all-out war as the solution. Do uh, he 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 emph- he really uh, put a strong word asking uh, the people of Philippines do they think that uh, they will be able to talk peace after the shooting has started when the wounds and the failure of the talks would be raw. Congress must make sure that the Bangsa Moro Basic Law, if it is passed, will fall in, uh, sorry, if it's passed, will fall within the constitution. The Bangsa Moro is a proposed autonomous political entity within the Philippines. The proposal is part of the framework agreement on the Bangsa Moro, a preliminary peace agreement signed between the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the government. So the question is, Aquino's rating have been deep extremely. Can he find a genuine peace solution that truly address the roots of the problem that is led by violence. In fact, the, Philippon- the Filipinos are quite vocal about getting rid of the Bangsa Moro basic law. But why is he not listening? So there must be some kind of miscommunication or misunderstanding between the government and the people that uh, the Aquino's administration needs to address. On the other hand, Malaysia is preparing for an influx of refugees if southern Philippines stocks breaks down. Malaysia is in fact preparing offshore military bases in the Sulu Sea to prepare for an influx of hundreds of thousands of displaced southern Filipinos if peace talks between uh, both parties uh, did, will not uh, if it doesn't really go out to the direction that both of them would want to. In fact, Defence Minister Hishamuddin Hussein said the bases are expected to be fully operational in Sabah waters by next month. He said security forces were also preparing for the possibility of displaced people from southern Philippines entering the country to escape a war. If the peace process can't go through in June, then it means war, 12 years of talks, and because of one incident, they will have war. That is really, really an, a very unfortunate event if it unfolds. In fact, uh, Hishamuddin was referring to the January gun battle in Mama Sa. Pano town that killed 44 Filipino elite commando and 20 uh, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front personnel. So the situation in the southern Philippines is not getting any better. In fact, um, if it doesn't, if it's not being handled well, it might get worse, and Malaysia will be affected by this. On another news in Indonesia, about 4,000 fishermen, some enslaved, stranded on Indonesian island. An estimated 4,000 foreign fishermen are stranded on a number of remote islands in eastern Indonesia, including men revealed, in an, revealed by the Associated Press investigation, which to have been enslaved. Uh, this is uh, according to an aid group. Many of the migrant workers 
were abandoned by their boat captains following a government moratorium on foreign fishing that has docked vessels to crack down on illegal operations. It is reasonable to expect many are victims of trafficking, if not outright slavery. Journalists interviewed more than 40 migrant workers from Myanmar who said they have been brought to Indonesia from Thailand and are forced to work on trawlers with Thai captains. Some are, re- some, are, some are runaways, slaves who have lived in the island for 5, 10 or even 20 years. They describe horrendous working conditions while at sea saying that they were forced to drink unclean water and work 20 to 22 hour shifts with no day offs. The report prompted the U.S. government and major seafood industry leaders to renew their calls on the Thai government to crack down on slavery at sea and to punish those responsible. Seafood industry by developed countries are causing uh, uh, a syndicate in remote islands in Indonesia. In fact, the U.S. has vowed to investigate together with Thailand to punish those that are responsible but in reality how much of it can be happened because this is nothing new in in terms of the news of slavery in the fishing in that fisheries industry industries involving um, migrant workers from Myanmar and Thailand especially a lot of things needs to be addressed in this matter on another news Villagers in Cambodia are taught to fight back against land grabbing. Australia is stepping in to educate the villagers. Even so, the villagers are are having limited education, given that majority of the multinational corporation will be tricky. How effective is this? The barren land near Cambodia, village Ren Min's home, used to yield cashew nuts and root vegetable crops. Now the vast expanse lies bare and dry, leveled by bulldozers and said to become yet another rubber tree plantation. Australians are helping to combat the so-called land grabbing through a program teaching locals to fight back. The five-year 1.8 1.8 million advocacy package is funded by the World Vision Australia's fundraising efforts. It has taught villagers in Cambodia's north to challenge land grabbing by seeking media attention, filing complaints with the courts and all politicians, attending training sessions and holding public forums. We work to empower the community for for sustainable natural resources management so people understand that they need to protect the area for their livelihood. However, the villagers are up against large corporations with substantial resources and corruption within government. So this is uh, an area that is really, really tricky. But of course, with the villages in Cambodia are fighting back against land grabbing. It seems like hope is not all gone, but a lot of things have to be done in terms of trying to protect the interests of the local community. I think one of it is to create policies that really would be, uh, that would protect or be a safety net for the local community. But of course, to create those policies, we need a government that is responsible to the needs of the people. And when governments are corrupted, when uh, governments work hand in hand with corporations, this uh, would result in the situation we have right now where uh, a company where companies, uh, especially multinational companies, uh, would just do whatever they want in a country as if it's their own father's land. Well, that's what um, uh, the Malay word would use. Um, but at the same time, I think batting com- corruption is one of the key agenda in Southeast Asia, not just in Cambodia, but all over Southeast Asia. At the same time, Philippines... Uh, on another news, is looking to tourism revival. 
after a challenging year for tourism, uh, which means that they are not getting as much tourists as they want to be. The Philippines is hoping that an international marketing campaign, major events and further regional integration as part of the ASEAN economic community will provide a boost to momentum in 2015. The authorities are hoping that campaigns such as the visit the Philippine years and onset the AEC will see growth in visitors numbers um, return to, to 2013 levels when tourist arrivals expanded by 9.5 percent but the problem is it's not just about marketing or branding or even tagging on the AEC uh, uh, appeal is also because on the political situation in the country itself. For example, a series of kidnappings in the archipelago's south last year, along with other security issues, has prompted some governments in key source markets to issue warnings and all outright advisories against traveling in the Philippines. Uh, and at the same time, we all know that uh, what happened on Southern Thai really affected uh, Philipp the Philippines' image as a happy and welcoming city. It's being plowed by terrorism, by acts of uh, violence, and of course by, in a way, uh, they are un unable to settle the peace agreement uh, between the Filipinos' government and the Bangsa Moro. At the same time, China's accounted for more than a tenth of Philippines' tourism intake. A decline in visitor numbers from the country is a cause for concern. Uh, they, well, they better settle for the, the differences if they want to get more Chinese visiting the Philippines. Maybe make it more attractive to the Chinese how... Uh, Oh, at the same time, I think it's also because of the dispute between China and the Philippines on the South China Sea that makes the Philippines not as, as, as an attractive place to visit. Well, that's a tricky issue to be settled or to be addressed. That's all from me today, Arlene. And of course, you can always listen to us via our website, duranasen.com or via... Our, uh, your mobile by downloading the TuneIn app and search for Duran ASEAN. Of course, you can always listen to our podcast on our YouTube channel, Duran ASEAN or Duran TV. And besides that, you can always uh, engage with us on our social media platform, our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. That's all from me, from me today. Have a good uh, weekdays. And of course, uh, hopefully for the Malaysian parties, uh, listeners, hope that uh, GST will bring more prosperity, quote-unquote.